right, everyone, welcome back to another fantastic Wednesday night Bible study here at Serenity Village Community Church. So glad you guys are tuning in again, whether you're watching live, whether you're watching this at 3 a.m. Um, because for some reason you're awake and you've got nothing better to do, or whether you're watching it at work, on your lunch break, I'm sure, wherever you are, wherever you're watching it, whenever you're watching it, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for commenting, for engaging in the discussions we have here. So happy to be here. Um, there's a really good energy in the room tonight, and I know you guys aren't physically in here, but I hope you can sense that through the, through, the, the, through the video waves, through the audio waves. We've got a great energy here because God is good and his spirit is continually with us. Can I get an amen in the comments there? So tonight we are continuing our series on the truth about biblical heroes. And just as a quick recap, if you haven't seen the last couple of weeks, which if, um, if you're watching this as a recorded version later on, you might wanna pause it and go back and watch uh, last week and the week before because these concepts and these stories they really build on each other over time. And nothing that we've been talking about is, is kind of done in a vacuum. It's, it's, it's building on itself. It's proving a point and showing concepts that I hope you're seeing. But in the first week, we talked about Thomas the disciple. And as I've said the last couple of weeks, many of you have known him as Doubting Thomas. Now, we have officially, and I hope officially for all of you listening and watching, have put that label to bed to where we no longer call him Doubting Thomas. Because this was a man of incredible faith. And a lot of times in these stories, and we really saw this in the example of Thomas, we make some assumptions and, to be fair, some educated guesses about people's character, their habits, their beliefs, their heart, their motives. We make a lot of assumptions at times. And, and at times, as I said, these are educated guesses. Um, these are well-informed opinions, which are not necessarily wrong. But there are times where we project our own flaws and our own insecurities into the stories of the people that we read in the Bible. And if we're not aware of that, we can really miss a lot of truth in their stories. Now, when we looked at Thomas, we noticed that he was the one that when Jesus said he had to go into a certain city and all the disciples said, don't go because the Pharisees and the people there are trying to kill you. Thomas is the only one who said, we're going with him. And if we die, if he dies, we die with him. That doesn't sound like a man full of unbelief and doubt to me. That sounds like a warrior. That sounds like someone who understood who Jesus was. Now, we also talked about David. And we saw a lot of incredible things in the life of David. We, we actually didn't even get to the point where he faces Goliath. And the reason we didn't get to that point last week is because Goliath is not the point of the life of David. Goliath isn't even a highlight. He's not even the highlight of the life of David. It's a big moment to be sure, and that's what 99.9% .9 of us think. We hear David and, insert, Goliath. It was a big deal, and we've got books written about facing your giants, and these are good, important books. These are important things to study. It is crit critical to face the things that are in front of us. But David didn't look at Goliath as, oh my goodness, here's this big obstacle, and here's the test of my faith, so let's see how it goes. And I'm going to prove my faith, prove my heart, prove my identity by defeating this giant. It really wasn't that. Goliath was a, a byproduct of who David was. There was a word spoken over his life. An identity was placed in his heart that he accepted and walked in. Now, because of that, we see how heroes walk and live. And so tonight I want to look a little bit more into the life of David. And, and one of the reasons that this, um, this study came across or came up was, I realized both for myself and for the vast majority of Christians, we've looked at these heroes throughout Scripture and throughout the Bible, and we've seen so many of their flaws, which are there, and they're accurate. We could spend entire months going over the flaws of everyone in the Bible. We could spend years going over the flaws that we see in our own lives. But is that the point? Is that what we're supposed to learn from these stories? Is here's the things you should avoid because here's the things they did wrong and you should avoid doing wrong the things that they did wrong and therefore you will become a better person. Is that really what we're supposed to take from these? Or is there something deeper? Is there a heart? Is there a principle behind these things? And perhaps we judge them a bit harshly because we see a lot more than they saw at the time. We weren't there. We weren't in their situations. We weren't part of their culture or part of their time period. We didn't face what they faced. 
So I want us to take a bit of a step back when we start criticizing these heroes of faith. And now most of you are familiar, and I've said this the last couple of weeks, with um, this, this idea of God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And I'm gonna keep repeating this, amen, 100% agreed. You don't have to perfect yourself. You don't have to be this shining example of humility and perfection in the world before God is going to call you and before he wants to use you, before he wants to be with you. He will meet you right where you are at, faults, flaws, sin, and all. He doesn't wait for you to fix yourself before he comes into your life. In fact, the Bible is very clear that while we were once far away, while we were running away from God, he chased us down. He came after us. He sent his son to us. So that's all true. And we also shouldn't ignore that these um, characters in, in the Bible did make mistakes. Absolutely, they did. But when I see things like, look at all the terrible things that these heroes did, or even look at their inadequacies. Moses had a stutter. Well, yes, he did. Gideon was insecure. David had an affair. Thomas was a doubter. Abraham lied. I see all these things. Moses was a murderer. I see all of these things put into a nice bullet point for us so that we can project and relate with weakness and failure. And if that happens, I have a problem with it. Now, again, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Amen. I'm 100% on board with that. But I do think it's time that we stop focusing on the faults and the failures of these great people and start recognizing the spirit and the heart that they walked in because we have been given something even beyond that. So we talked about David and uh, when, when he was anointed to be the king, we talked about him going to the battlefield. And there's one other thing that's so interesting to me when you read the story of David coming to the battlefield, facing Goliath and all of that, which we went into more detail last week. When he got to the battlefield and saw Goliath, he didn't pray, dear God, should I go and face this giant? Should I volunteer to go and defeat this giant? He didn't pray, um, God, what kind of armor should I wear when I do go confront the giant? He even didn't pray, okay, God, now I'm on my way to face this giant. I'm walking. What do I do? How do I attack him? He didn't pray. He didn't take time apart from that and seek God. Now, there are times in his life where he does that. There are many times in our lives we need to do that. This is not a, you don't need to pray. But it's interesting that when someone's walking with the Spirit of God, with the heart and the faith of Jesus Christ in them, in that identity, you don't have to stop every four and a half minutes and pray, well, should I get this beverage or this beverage? Should I eat this meal or this meal? He walked through what he was and what he ended up doing was aligned with who he was. He didn't take the armor to battle. He had his sling because that's what he knew. That's what he was equipped with. That's what his identity already was. Now, I want to move on to this because there's so much. And, and guys, honestly, if there is one person that you take time to study in the Bible and read through their story, it very well possibly should be David. I, you know, Jesus too, obviously, he, he, gets, you know, he gets the head of that line. But there's something like two books, two and a half books almost written on the life of David. His life was incredible. And we're barely going to scratch the surface of it with last week and tonight. But here's some things that he goes through. So after Goliath, he's praised as a champion by the people. He continues to serve Saul. He doesn't try to overthrow Saul. He continues to serve him. Saul tries to kill David multiple times. David's sitting there playing music in the court and Saul gets really upset, chucks a spear at him, barely misses him. David escapes with his life. This happens multiple times. David becomes best friends with Jonathan, who is Saul's son, and who is, according to that time and culture, supposed to be the next in line to be king. They have a strong bond. They become best friends. Ultimately, David has to flee from, from the palace, from living around the kingdom of Saul. He has to flee because Saul is literally trying to kill him every moment and has his servants out to do the same. So David runs away. He flees to a city called Nob, as in Dor, and it's a priestly city. Now he's there and he's, he's on his own. He's running from the king. He's, he's a fugitive at this point. And he goes to the priest and he says, I need some bread and I need some weapons. And the priest basically, now this is a, a very summarized version, by the way. The priest says, here's some bread. And the only weapon we have here is, oh yeah, the sword of Goliath. 
Now this, if there was ever a, a person or a character to make a movie about, it's the life of David. A good one too. Not the cheesy, like low budget Christian movies where everyone's smiling all the time and when they're going through terrible things, not like an intense Avengers level kind of a movie needs to be done about the life of David. So he gets to this city and wouldn't you know it, that's where the sword of Goliath is being kept. So he gets that sword to go on his journey. And he tells the priest, look, I'm on this secret mission from the king. I can't tell you what's going on. I just need supplies. He continues to flee from Saul and ends up in the city of Gath, which, by the way, was Goliath's hometown. Now, some servants of the king of that city recognize David, and they say, wait a minute, isn't this David? So they bring him before the king, and David, in that moment, realizes, hey, my life is in jeopardy. They're about to kill me. And so he starts acting insane, clinically, mentally insane. He starts writing on the walls, scratching doors and drooling and and eating grass, all these things. He starts acting insane. And the king says, do I not have enough mentally unstable people around me already that you brought me another one? Get rid of this guy. So David escapes there. He flees and hides in a cave. And this is where things start to get really interesting, continue to get interesting, at least in in my estimation. He's hiding in a cave and he is got such the spirit of God around him, such a a magnetic personality. He is so much a a king of the people in his heart, even though he doesn't have the title yet, that people from all over that are in debt, that are despondent, that have been cast out, that are afraid, they come to him and he becomes their leader. This is incredible stuff. He goes and he saves a city that's under attack, an Israelite city that's under attack from the Philistines. And then the people of that city want to hand him over to Saul. He's going through all this chaos where anywhere he goes, people are trying to kill him. The king of the nation is continually trying to kill him. And yet he's walking in confidence in his identity, treating people well, seeking the heart of God because he has the heart of God in him and walking that way. Now, this is one thing that you might have heard about um, the story of David when he, when he, um, He meets Saul in a cave. Actually, let's just go ahead and read it here. Since, you know, it's a Bible study, we should probably get to some actual Bible verses. In 1 Samuel 24, Saul took 3,000 men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks. Now he came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the cave. And the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day that the Lord said to you, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Now what they're saying is that, David, we know you've been anointed to be the king. And Saul being in this cave right now is God's way of telling you that it's time to walk in that promise. It's time to take that position, take up that title. Now, David was well in his, within his rights culturally at the time to kill Saul and take the kingdom, both because the people loved David and because he had been anointed to do it. Now, was it the right thing to do? No. But there are voices around him. There are people, and this applies to us. There, are, there will be people around you that look at circumstances and situations and say, well, this is where you need to strike. This is what you need to do to take on that mantle that God said was for you. And I, I kind of look at it this way. How much division do we see in the body of Christ because of this mindset? Like if someone is called to be a pastor of a church, their first, their first instinct, and I've had these conversations, so it's not just my opinion on this. Now, there are, there's, this isn't for everyone. Their first instinct is, all right, what are the people in my current church that I can take to go start my own church? Because that's the call of God on my life. That's what I believe he's calling me to do. So how can I take from what's already here and go start my own thing? David is so confident in who he is that he doesn't feel the need to tear anything else down to build what is his. He doesn't feel the need to eliminate someone else's position, even though at this point, Saul is an evil man trying to kill him. The spirit of God has left Saul. By all rights, that's what David should do. It would bring unity to the kingdom, would it not? But because David respected the anointing of God, the word of God so much, not only on himself, 
but that God had anointed Saul to be the king, he refused to take matters into his own hands. Now, does that mean David was this passive, submissive, kind of a wimpy, pathetic person? Um, absolutely not. If you spent more than five minutes reading his story, he was a man of, of great passion, a man of great strength, but he knew when to use that, when to apply it, and when not to. And so he even feels bad about cutting off the edge of Saul's cloak here. So it says in verse five through seven, it came about afterwards, David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. And David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave and went on his way. You know, I wonder, I wonder how many times in our life, you know, even today, we see all of this pressure and all of these opinions around us on what you need to do to walk in what God has spoken over you. If you receive a word from God, something that's on your heart that you know is from him, the identity he's given you, let's say, but there's all these voices and opinions around you saying, well, this is what you need to do to walk out that identity and to prove that identity and to make sure that you're, you're, you're doing it the way we think you should do because culturally, this is how it should be done right now. This is the easiest way to the throne. It's right there in front of you. But if it goes against identity, if it goes against the word of God, which David understood that killing Saul would, he didn't do it. Now, I do want to take some time tonight and look at one more, uh, one more aspect of David's life. Because this is incredible. And actually, before we get there, um, how this story ends up going. After Saul leaves the cave, David rises up and says, uh, Hey, Saul, I know you're out to kill me. And again, you can, you can read this in the, in the scriptures below. This is the paraphrasing for the sake of our time tonight. Because I just want to get as much in as we can. Because I love this story, just to be honest. He says, Look, I could have killed you. Everyone told me to do it, but I'm not going to stretch my hand against you. He actually calls him father, by the way, too. And he says, I've got nothing against you. I'm not coming against you, Saul. You're the anointed one. I'm not trying to harm you. So, so why are you coming at me? If people have told you things about me, don't believe them. But I could have killed you and I didn't because I'm not that kind of person. There's, there's a love and there's a respect here. And Saul's eyes are open to it at that point. He understands what's going on. He sees David in this proper context. And that's actually kind of a, a hallmark of the life of Saul, where he sees the truth. He sees the right way. He sees the glory and the honor of something. He sees the word of God. And then he flips and just goes 180 degrees in the other direction at another, another, another moment's notice. He's kind of unstable in that way. But that's who David is a man of such confidence and identity that he faced this giant that no one else was even willing to approach. He walked confidently in his identity when situations arose around him and his life was threatened multiple times. He never felt the need to lash out at the people who were trying to kill him. He didn't need to do that. We can't even help ourselves from having a Facebook debate with our brothers and sisters. If we're being honest... I'm as guilty as that, um, of that as anyone. One of the best things I ever did was to delete uh, some social media apps off of my phone. It was very refreshing. I'm not saying you need to do that to prove that you're not this angry person. What I'm saying is it is so easy for the enemy to prod us into these bickering back and forth things to where we're not acting out of identity and confidence anymore. We're, we're reacting because there was something that came up that sparked this thought, sparked this emotion in us, and now we react to it. But what I'm trying to get us to see, myself included, that someone with identity, with a word from God over their lives, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to respond like that. You don't have to walk that way. There is something so much greater and so much sweeter. And when I study the life of David and see all these incredible things, I think we have the audacity to look at his life and say, yeah, but he had an affair. I get that. He did a terrible thing. He ended up um, arranging for the husband of Bathsheba to be killed in battle. It was a terrible thing. 
There were some big consequences for that in the life of David. But if you're going to will down his entire life story, this hero, a man after God's own heart, and we're going to whittle that down to, yeah, well, he had an affair. And his, his family life at times, his kids didn't always act the best. Man, we are missing out. We are missing the point. And I can't help but wonder if we're so quick to point out these faults and flaws. Is it because we're so insecure about ourselves? Is it because if we bring heroes down a notch, if we bring these historical heroes and characters down a notch, we don't feel so bad about where we are? Now, this is not meant to be any kind of condemnation or convicting message or anything like that. Because if you guys have been, you know, listening to me for any length of time, or if you've had a conversation with me, you know that's absolutely not who and what I am. I just want to see the heart of God. I want to ask him how I walk with that same heart because that's what I've been given. I want to be able to understand and see and acknowledge when the enemy is trying to get me and in, in, goad me into doing something that's against that character, that's contrary to that identity. Because the, the world around us is so good at triggering all these things. The other aspect of this is if we focus so much on these flaws, we focus so much on these faults, we tear down the character of the person that we're looking at. And if that's the case, then when we see things in Hebrews 11 and 12 about how we've got this great cloud of witnesses around us, you're not very likely to take encouragement from them. If you've got a bunch of liars, cheaters, and murderers cheering you on in this great cloud of witnesses, you're not going to receive that. I won't either. But if we realize the greatness of these people, the greatness of what's been given to us, each and every one of us, maybe we can start looking at things a bit differently and looking at ourselves differently, ultimately. Because that's the motivation of this whole thing. This isn't, this isn't designed to be a study or a series where we learn some new facts about people that we've studied before, that we, you know, we have this cool kind of counter thing about Thomas where he's not doubting Thomas and we can argue with our friends and family members about that because, oh, you call them doubting Thomas. Well, I know more than you. If we can get past that nonsense and that ridiculousness, I hope we can see the power, the magnitude of what these people walked in. That the spirit of God literally changes nations, changes communities, but first it changes the individual. I've seen a lot of people with ideas on how we can change our nation. I haven't seen a lot of people saying, this is how I'm changing myself. I need to focus on that. Now what they had, the spirit of God that David walked in, the heart of God that David walked in, the faith that he walked in, we'll get into that another time. It is powerful. It's amazing. It's dangerous. Passion is a dangerous thing. The spirit of God is a dangerous thing. It disrupts a lot of things that are comfortable. A lot of people through the life of David weren't comfortable with how he did things. You look at the life of Samson. His own family wasn't comfortable with how he did things, but the Bible says that he did them because the spirit of God enabled him to and encouraged him to and compelled him to. I hope we start to see that that's what we've been given and not just what they had because the Bible also says what they had is a fraction of what we've been given. We've been given the spirit of God to live in us each and every day. Not a watered down version, not some one day when I get to heaven in the sweet by and by version, but right now, wherever you are with whatever you're facing and going through. Now we're kind of out of time for this portion and and I wanted to get to the story of Abigail. So I'm going to give everyone a little bit of homework. In Samuel, 1 Samuel, it starts in chapter 25, or the story is largely in chapter 25. We see David encountering this woman named Abigail. And if you're already familiar with the story, go and read it again, but read it in the, in the context and from the perspective of everything we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And you're going to see something amazing here. If you haven't read that story before, well, you should probably read it because that's what we'll talk about next week. Abigail, and this is one of my wife's favorite characters in the Bible. And as I've studied 
her approach to David, how she spoke to him, how she influenced his heart, it is possibly the, if not the greatest, one of the greatest examples that I have seen in all of history and in all of the Bible on how to influence the heart of someone, especially how to influence the heart of a man. So it's incredible things. I love this so much, guys. I hope you're getting something out of this as well. This stuff, when it comes alive to you, when you actually see things that are applicable, that you can take and you can let um, sit in your heart that resonate with your spirit, this stuff comes alive. I spent so many years memorizing scriptures, having no connection to them whatsoever. But when I realized God was my father and he was imparting something to me and he was walking with me because he's a good father that loves his children, everything changed. So we're gonna play this short video and I'm gonna be back with Pastor Danny Hernandez to have a great conversation about some things. So stick around. Maybe God's waiting for us to have hope in him again. I go to the good news, because when I go to the good news first, I can discern the bad news or the fake news or the news I don't have to concern myself. Because you know what? He said it, that settles it, and I'm running with it. bad habits or whatever it is. It can be the smallest thing or the most extreme thing. I've seen those fall off because their identity was lifted up. Instead of, let me bash these things off of you like we're playing whack-a-mole and you always have a problem that comes up because ultimately, all you end up doing is pushing a person down. Don't bring your old wounds into your new destiny. Don't do it, but talk to Jesus about it. Have you ever been so close to real freedom, and you got complacent? Have you ever been so close to full restoration of family, finances, health, confidence, joy, peace, serenity, strength, patience? So close, I'm so close, I can taste it. You need is someone who has an identity and has the Spirit of God to walk that out. And giants falling are a byproduct of that. My heart is to always glorify God. My heart is to always respond to God's love. That's my heart, my heart and my desire. But if you're one of those people that likes to talk, you need to take time out to listen. And sometimes he speaks loudest in his silence. It's a great feeling to give, to give back to what's been given to me. But the biggest thing that I get from what I do is the people in my life. It's a a feeling and a realization of no matter what state I'm in, I know that you've got me and you know that I've got you. I have people in my life that give me that, you know, and I listen to them because I know that they have my best interest in mind. Between my talent and my tithe and my time, I, I think that I can contribute. And that's what I always shoot. Okay, so the food we take from here, we bring it to South Minneapolis, where the problem was. So we deliver it to all the houses there and all the races. So and we do it because we love, you know, the people there. And God so want us to do so, so that's why we're doing it. Every week we do it like block to block. So we go knock on the door and, you know, talk to the people, share the gospel, and, you know, here's a little something, you know. Because so the virus, too, you know, a lot of people are not working. So we're trying to help where, the best way we can. South uh, Minneapolis, like, right now we're doing it, like, from 29 to 24. So, and then we go all the way to Chicago and Bloomington Avenue. All right, everyone, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for being with us here. I have, uh, as I mentioned, special guest with me, Pastor Danny Hernandez, the man, the myth, the legend. I love your shirt tonight. Love is dope. I don't know where you get all these cool shirts, but you, you might be in the top, well, you're certainly in the top three 
of people with the coolest collection of shirts I've ever seen. So kudos to you on that. Thanks. Where did this one come from? This one comes from a company called uh, Human Citizens, which is where I get pretty much all of my shirts from that have some kind of writing on, on them. So, yeah. I think at some point we might need to do a, either a real talk or a after Wednesday night on fashion. Probably won't do that tonight, but thanks for being here. Um, as always, I, I don't exactly know where our conversation is going to go tonight. That's kind of in the Pastor Jeff MO, and when he does it, it works out great. So we'll just kind of see what happens here. But as I've, been, as I've been thinking about these things, looking at characters in the Bible, these heroes, and specifically David, him being a man after God's own heart, I wanted to kind of get your perspective on that. What, what does it mean to you for him to have been a man after God's own heart? And is there an application for us where that's something we either have been given that we should walk in or should strive for? Or what does that kind of look like to you? Um, for me, I think considering David a man after God's own heart, um, I think it really plays into what God's heart is, which is relationship. And um, I think you see that in his life. There's constant relationship happening. There's communication happening. There's faults and uh, forgiveness happening. And so I think that's something, that, I think that's one of the key things. He wants more than anything to glorify God and to worship God. But I think also, I mean, just looking at the Bible story, looking at the fact that God sent his own son to die for us, to establish this relationship, is, again, he goes ahead and has a relationship with God. He talks to God. He writes so many songs to God. He, he laments over his brokenheartedness to God. He talks about his trials to God. He doesn't just go to God when things are, are great and well. He doesn't just go ahead and take his anointing and respond to his anointing um, from Samuel. He doesn't, and then take it to God. He doesn't just wait 15 more years until he's king. And then he's like, all right, now we're good. I'm good with you, God. Like you, you follow through. Awesome. He writes songs in the field. He writes songs in the, you know, the castle. Like he, he's constantly talking to God about everything and processing things with God through everything. He takes his faults to God. He questions God. He wonders where God is. He does all that stuff, which is proof of a really healthy relationship. It doesn't always look good and feel good and sound good, but I think that's what God wants. God doesn't want just the clean. He wants to take your dirty too. That, that level of honesty, which, I mean, for me for years at least, I, I, wouldn't, I didn't want to approach that, that level or that intense honesty and openness about things. Because for whatever reason, and I could, I could point my finger at you know, anything I wanted to, but at the end of the day, it was me. I didn't want that vulnerability because, you know, whether it was fear of, you know, how God is going to see me or how other people are going to see me. And I think it's that, that fear, that insecurity maybe that keeps people from that level of honesty and openness, but isn't ultimately that kind of a silly thing when it comes to a relationship with God. Like, what are you going to hide from God? Right. What does he already not know? But at the same time, we, we all know that, but we still have this, this thing sometimes where we're hiding things. What is that all about? I, I think it goes back all the way back to the garden. And I'm actually like studying this too as a part of a sermon that I'm preparing also. And that before Adam and Eve take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they're naked and they're cool with it. They're exposed completely before God and don't think twice about it. It's not even a thought. It's not like they were created and then some part of the Bible just goes ahead, oh, excerpt, um, David felt super uncomfortable. It doesn't say that at all. And so once they take from this, this tree, all of a sudden it becomes an issue and I have to go into hiding. I have to go ahead and cover myself. And they actually didn't even cover themselves as a response to taking from the tree. They, they covered themselves as a response from God calling out. So that takes it even further. It's once God responds to something that you may have done, my response to that is to go ahead and hide. And it leads me to do something even more stupid, which was they covered themselves up in fig, fig leaves, which is the itchiest leaf you could possibly cover yourself up in. And I think when it comes to, to our flesh, when it comes to knowledge, our response typically is to hide ourselves instead of exposing ourselves 
which is what God wants. Because you, like you said, you can't hide anything from God. So no matter what you put over yourself, no matter what you cover yourself with, God's like, I see right through that. But that's not what I want. I don't want to x-ray your life. I want you to just be like, hey, this is what it is. You know, this is what I have a, a doubts about. This is what I have questions about. Um, this is what I'm anxious about. This is what I'm joyful about. You know, like I said, it's good, the good and the bad. God wants you to bring all of your junk to him. But I'm pretty sure God appreciates too when you're just like, man, I just feel good when I listen to this song, God. That's just, it has nothing to do with anything other than how you feel, but that's everything to God. Do you think that that should start on a, I guess what I would call a smaller level? Because you had mentioned David's calling. He didn't wait till he was in the castle. He was, he was active in that word in everything he did. When, when he was writing a song in the field, watching his sheep killed, lying in the bear, all these things. So it's not that he waited for a title or an event to happen. Do you think at times we tend to do that and think, okay, well, there's this relationship I have with God and it's event-based instead of it's, it's small event-based. Like I kind of look at it as my relationship with my kids, there was a big event that happened when they came into the world. That, it was kind of a big deal, mm-hmm. but that didn't build the relationship. The relationship has been built over the years of me interacting with them on all of these small things, whether it's a game they like, a toy that they like, drawing something or making up you know, words with them, whatever it is, teaching them little things. Maya's starting a lot of school, like going through that process. And I think sometimes we'll look at the relationship with God as we'll take David's example of when he was given the word and then we'll look at him as the king writing all these songs in the castle. And we forget that there's all this stuff, little by little, in the day-to-day, the mundane and boring things where that relationship was just as active. Could you imagine? Could you imagine only connecting with your, your, your sons or your daughter and milestones? Like, until you acknowledge me as father and you say dad or dada, I don't know you. Can you, can you think about that, though? And it, we, we sometimes treat things that way, too. And, you know, I don't acknowledge Ramona until she can go ahead and roll over. Then I will go ahead and acknowledge and we'll celebrate it and then we'll move on. Or I don't acknowledge her until she falls. Like, but like you said, it's the little things. It's the little things that they're able to build up. And here's the crazy part, too. I mean, I have to go back and refresh, but taking, taking a look at, at 2 Samuel and looking at the story of David... It doesn't hit too much of the in-between. There's like the anointing, and then there's like the moment, a couple of other moments that are in there. And I think possibly it's because the writer knows what humans like to look for, which is the big moments. Right. But sometimes there's a hint at the little moments, like when they, they go ahead and Saul's being tormented, and his, his uh, people go ahead and are like saying, hey, we, we know of a player who plays really good music. And where did they go and find him? In the field playing music having a little moment but it's a quick sentence it's a quick verse that you don't think about and so you're focused on David and Goliath you're focused on go on him going ahead and fighting the Philistines on him getting the ark back but we don't think about the smaller moments we don't think about the moment that wasn't a big deal to to anyone else but Michael that he danced his clothes off but that was a a little moment that someone thought it's enough to go ahead and put in here but it wasn't anything crazy. Yes, he was celebrating that he got the Ark of the Covenant back, but it wasn't nothing crazy. But yeah, can you imagine if God only acknowledged you and worked with you the moment that you acknowledged him, right. right? Or the moment that there was just some bigger event or whatever? Like he cares about your Mondays. He doesn't just care about your, your paydays, right? Where we're like, hey, tithe, right? He cares about your Mondays. He cares when you're broke. He cares when you, when you get paid. He cares every single minute of every day. Let's, let's go a little bit more into that. So what does it mean when, when we say that God cares about those things? And from the aspect of you and I be, both being fathers of young children, and we, we see all the time that it's taken, even in just a, a couple of years, all so much time put into a relationship that largely hasn't had a ton of big events like my oldest is five. She hasn't graduated high school. She hasn't started a business. She hasn't, she hasn't like won a track. She hasn't done anything that we would consider big, but there's so much time invested in the relationship and all these little things. And I, to your point, I think we miss that when we just read a story that's a few chapters because we can read it in 
five, 10, 15, 30 minutes, when it was a lifetime, when it was years before, between these events. So there was years of this relationship being built. So how is you being a father, um, how is that, how is your perspective um, fit with that? How have you seen that relationship aspect where it's not just, you know, a big event type of thing, the relationship between a good father and their child is largely built on the, the mundane day-to-day things. How has that changed? Well, to describe that, I also have to reference a question that someone asked. Uh, Crystal and I went and visited a couple of friends, and um, they hadn't seen us since we became parents, or they hadn't seen us since way before we became parents, and then probably at least six years or so. And so she asked, what is the hardest thing about being a parent? And I said, being selfish. And I think that plays into this question of, the relationship focusing on little things too and not just big milestones is because the little things take a lot of selflessness to think about the little things, to acknowledge the little things, to pay attention to the little things, to be interested in the little things. If you can imagine and think of all the milestones, the day you become, you're born, the day you roll over, the day you say your first word, the day that you crawl, the day that you walk, the day that you're potty trained, the day that you go to kindergarten, the day that you graduate high school, the day that you graduate college, the day that you get your career. That's 10 days out of a lifetime. And at that point, I probably only hit maybe until like your mid-20s. That's so many more days than 10 days. So what else is in between? And I think God's relationship with us is a perfect example of how we should be in relationship with one another and with our spouse and with our kids because we don't care about people's little things. We care about their big things. We care about when they get married, when they have kids, when they get a divorce, when they uh, get a promotion or a demotion, when they are, are unemployed, when they are struggling. We don't care about the little things, but all those little things, just like uh, who was it that built, rebuilt the wall again? I don't remember what, what prophet it was. Was it Jeremiah? Little rocks and little stones built that wall. No one came through with one already solid piece of cement wall, and all of a sudden the wall was built. It's stones and stones and stones, and every little person did their part because everyone built the wall in front of their home. Do so. you think we've kind of made relationships, even just taking church and spirituality out of it, we've made relationships more of an event-based thing, as, as a culture, as, as opposed to, you know, in the past, things were much smaller knit, closely knit communities and families together that were bonded. It was, I mean, this is kind of a cliche thing, but more of a small town atmosphere, local community atmosphere, where you are with these people day to day. Maybe not every day, but you're seeing these people throughout your day. But our world has kind of transitioned to where it's, a, it's more of a separate and event-based interaction. So our relationships are more event-based now, especially since, you know, since locking down um, in, our, in our, our nation and pretty much the world, we've cut out even a lot of events. Mm-hmm. And so it's few and far between when you even do get to connect with someone. And so how do you, how do you maintain a relationship with a, a person, let alone with God, when, it's, when you don't have those things? You're forced to see God in the day-to-day things. I remember a, a couple of years ago, I don't remember if I mentioned this um, in a real talk the last couple of weeks, but um, there was a men's event at some uh, local church was doing here. Brian Green was speaking at it. And so the first part we had all these events, like there was hatchet throwing, there was uh, mini golf, there was uh, a fishing thing, a throwing stuff, uh, a football activity, all this, all this great manly stuff, like uh, hammer and nail competitions, all this stuff. And then we had like a, uh, the spiritual time afterwards with a message. And the first thing he, Brian said when he got up there was, I want to ask you guys, is God more involved with us right now in the spiritual time or was he more involved with us before during all the activities? And it really made people think because we separate those things. We're like, okay, now it's, now it's sad time. Now it's Bible time. It's spiritual time. Before, it was just hanging out with the guys. But maybe we could start to see that God at least wants to be as much in those moments as he is when we crack open the Bible. Right, and I think... It, it goes so much deeper. I mean, what, we're going to be here till at least 9.30 tonight talking about this because we've 
compartmentalize areas of our life, not realizing that God overtakes all of it and he's in it, whether we see it or not, or whether we choose to have it be that way or not. But it's easier for us to compartmentalize areas of our life where this is my work life, this is my family life, this is my personal life, and this is my church life here. And there's so many more lives that we have. How many, we only have one life, but we say this is my work life. And then it's so much easier for me to, to only think about work at that time. And this is my personal life. And then how much easier is it for us to go ahead and mess up in certain areas of our lives because we have multiple lives, multiple identities, and then be okay with it because we think that our God life doesn't mesh with that part of our life there or my family life doesn't mesh with that part of our life right there. And it just, you know, you were referencing just the development. I would call it the development of human culture today, right? We've, we've urbanized, we've... There's a lot more people taking up the same amount of space. The earth hasn't grown at all. And it's one thing when you work yourself as an organism in a small town where everyone plays their part and it's the same people you see all the time. And then all of a sudden it gets more packed or you move away or things grow. I mean, the one statement I say to a lot of students when it comes to peer pressure or buckling down under like influences or whatever is you're not going to be friends with them in 10 years. Thinking about that in this conversation, in this context, is terrible. Because I'm not going to see you. I'm not going to be as invested. I'm not going to uh, be as connected. Then you should not matter to me now in this moment. And that's crazy to me, you know, to think about that. And, yeah, sometimes people do depart and other people come into your life and things like that. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think, again, to be really upfront and very forward is COVID has probably exposed that we weren't in relationship with people and with God like we thought we were. And because we base it off of big events and songs and uh, the mood or the sermon or the preacher or whatever, or our life circumstance, we thought that we were okay. And now when I have to take my faith home or I have to practice it on my own, I don't know what to do or I don't want to do it. And now I'm being exposed. My friendship's the same way. I have this technology at my hand, at my availability, and yet I still do not call my mom every day, text her every day, talk to her every day, video chat her every day. Even with kids now that should see their grandparents that are far away, I still don't do it. Many people still don't do it. People don't even talk to their neighbors anymore. If anything, to be very upfront and real, COVID has exposed that we didn't know how to do relationships and our relationships were as shallow as they come. And I think we have great opportunity and potential. I think this is why small groups is such an important piece to it, too. We could be doing so much. There's so much potential that Serenity Village holds when it comes to still having community. It's just seeming a little bit different and people being okay with it because our ministries met once a month. There's no reason why they can't meet once a week right now. And even when things get back to normal, there's no reason why we can't meet in person once a month or quarterly and still meet weekly virtually. There's, you know, there's no reason why we can't do that. So what's, what's a starting point? Or I guess maybe I, I, would, I would ask, what has made the difference for you in your life, whether it's in ministry or just relationships out, outside of church, where you've seen those, those dynamics work, where you've either had a change of perspective for whatever reason and, and you've, you've changed the way you approach relationships or changed the way that you view your relationship with God? And I don't mean that it was broken before and then you, you fixed it, because as long as I've known you, you've been a, a, a strong, confident man and believe in God. So I don't mean you were this terrible person and then something changed. Now you're a Christian. I mean, just in the way you perceive that relationship. Because I mean, for, one, for myself, I grew up with much more of that event mindset when it came to my relationship with God. And then when the events weren't there, I was kind of left with, all right, what does this actually look like? It was, it was like the only time I had, you know, if, if the only time I interacted with my wife was when we went to a concert. Then during the week when we're hanging out, I have no idea what to talk to her about. If, we've, if all that we've done for five years is just gone to concerts together and had a great time, I don't know what to do when we're married and at home and have all these things to do. So what's kind of made some differences for you? I think it comes down to one thing. I think it's either you're in love or you're not. And I don't think there's an in-between in love or not. And if you're not in love, there's so many more different phases that you can be in. And that's why I'm, I don't want to discourage someone that's like, well, I'm not in love with God. I'm trying to figure that out or whatever. Because before I fell in love with my wife, I was curious. I was attracted to. 
I did have questions. I did want a court. I, I should have taken references, um, but I didn't, you know, she probably would have said no to me if she had taken references of me, you know, but when I wasn't in love, right? I wasn't in love. And so it wasn't until the point of being in love where that shift takes, pl- takes place. So I was brought up in, a, in a, a Christian home. I probably practiced, I would say I practiced my parents' faith, not my faith. It wasn't my own. I didn't own it. And then uh, I went to a Christian school, still probably wasn't even my own faith, just a random choice, random decision, kind of pressured by my youth pastor or whatever. But hey, it was what God had intended for me to do and called me to do anyways. But a moment where I would say I fell in love with God, it was hard because I can't even define like a day. I feel like it was a process. It was something, it was a moment that I had to go through and God had to carry me through and God had to see me through and guide me through that I'm like, dang, you're never leaving me. And so this is more than curiosity. Now I want to do the same for you. And now I'm falling in love with you. And now I'm just engaged with you. And that changes everything. When And so then now you might be asking yourself if you're watching, like, well, I don't, I'm not in love with my neighbor. But when you are in love with God, then there are certain people you are in love with as far as this romantic love. But if I'm in love with humanity the same way Jesus was in love with humanity, you can call it a love for, but at the end of the day, you're still in love because God is love, then you're in God. I'm in God in my relationship. And so that changes everything. And so that makes me want to have a deeper relationship. That makes me want to know your mundanes. That makes me want to know the, the little pieces. That makes me want to know your ups and downs, the things that make you happy, you, your interests. I want to learn more about you. I want to hear about you. I want you to know that, that I have your back. And so I think it goes back to, am I in love or not? And like I said, if you're not, it's okay because you in relationships, we're not always in love, but then we learn and then it's just a process. I think that that points out a, and I don't mean to be negative in this aspect of it, but think of that, taking that seriously, being in love as Jesus was with the world, and then realizing that so many people are going to knowingly, intentionally reject that love. As, as intense as it is, that has got to to break a heart on a level that I just don't want to ever feel. And even to take it a step further, if, if it's this father child relationship and it's my kids that are rejecting that love, I'm not going to be angry and want to hurt them. It's going to break my heart and I'm going to want them so desperately to see the truth and to see who I am, to see that relationship, to see that love and to accept it and build on it. So how do you think the heart of the father feels? And I don't mean, in not, not in a condemnation way, not in a, well, you better be doing it better way, because I look, I, I can't imagine either of us ever feeling that way about our children. I've seen the way you are with your kids. I know the way I am with mine. If my kids are struggling in the relationship, there's not a, a fiber of my being that's like, well, I guess you're just kind of messed up now, kid. Like if, if one of my children gets to be a teenager and goes through a rebellious phase, I'm, I'm not going to have this opinion of them of like, well, I guess, guess you're on your own now. I guess I don't really care about you as much. I even more so want to bring them into that relationship because they're my children. So, so how does the heart of a father see someone who is wanting to connect but is struggling to? Like I just, like you said, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm in love with God. I don't know where to start because my relationship has been built on all these events and now it's just me and him. I don't know where to start. What do you think that looks like to the heart of a father? Well, I think we, and you might disagree, some might disagree. This is what I think in response to that question is that we, father, and our hearts are different as humans than God is being God. And I mean that by this. My response to my kid not receiving my love or saying that I don't love them or that whatever my response is, okay, how can I love you more? How do I pull you in? We need to spend more time together. I need to go buy you this. I need to, to do that. I need to bend over backwards because I need you to see that I really do love you. God, I think, does this. Why? Why do you think I don't love you? Why don't you love me? why do you think you're not worthy of my love? 
And when he asked the question why, again, because this relationship and being honest and even going back to David, a person who brought everything to God and had conversations and back and forth with God, if you actually took that moment as a person that may not be believing, that may not say, may be rejecting God's love or believe that it's not real, if you actually took time to write down or speak out loud the response to God asking you why, I think God can then start doing a work in you. Because if your reason is, I'm not, why don't I receive your love? Because I'm not worthy of your love, God. Then God can begin to do a work in that. Because again, Adam and Eve, just be exposed in front of me. If you're saying, I don't receive your love because I don't believe it's real because it's too good to be true, then I've exposed it. And now God can take something with you exposing that saying, all right, why is it too good to be true? And we think God is just a God of action, but God is, God's one form of action too is conversation and talking and asking. And we don't do that in relationships. When my kid says that they don't really believe that they love me, I don't, I probably wouldn't ask why. I would probably do everything to negate that or my, I would argue back the reasons why I show that I do love you. But God can go ahead and just be patient and just be like, why? Why do you think that? Do you think that's, that stems a bit from how secure he must be in his love? Because he doesn't feel the need to prove it. He's, he's, he's done that. And so it's not, well, I need to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. He's got such, such a heart of security that he even wants to be with you in the doubt of it. Well, how much proof is there in just the question? We say, because we as humans think proof is in what I see. Proof is what I can touch. Proof is in what I hear. Proof is in what I experience, but there's proof in his asking why. Because what other relationships sometimes in the people that we think love us the most or the people we say we love the most, that when we hear something we don't like, we don't agree with, doesn't make us feel good, our response is never to ask. It's never to dig. Our response is to either expose a loophole, expose a lie, show them how they're wrong, all those things you were talking about. But there's proof in how much he loves us, and that's how he proves that he loves us, just by simply asking why, by simply wanting to have a conversation. I was also interested when you said, I don't, I don't remember how you exactly just phrased it, um, but we, we, we see God as a God of action, but sometimes his action is asking the, asking the question, the conversation, I think is what you said. Mm -hmm. So is, it's, not, it's not always a do something. It's more of a word that's spoken or words that are exchanged. And it's, it's so interesting. We'd have to spend more time on this another night because I know we're getting close to it. But the, when I've gone back and looked at all these characters in the Old and the New Testament, I, I always remember them because of what they did. But when I study their life and their story, it never started with what they did. Everything started with a word that was spoken over them. Whether it's Abraham, I'm making you the father of many nations. Before he did anything, when he comes to Gideon, he says, you're a, you're a valiant warrior when he, before he did anything. And, there's, and actions flowed out of that, obviously, but everything started with a word spoken and the acceptance of that word, ultimately. So I think that, that does something in my mind that really shifts perspectives where it's, I'm not looking for God to do something. I'm looking for the relationship and the conversation now. And out of that, you can call it identity. You can call that uh, strength or state of being. Out of that, things flow, and then the re relationship develops. What are the first words he spoke? In what he spoke allowed action to happen. He spoke first, let there be light. And it happened. He didn't have to snap fingers. He didn't have to cre create in the form of, I take my hands and I do this with it. He spoke it into existence. And so he, when he speaks... It sticks, it stays, it lasts forever. It moves into action. He said, you're going to be the father of many nations. We're still experiencing that. It reverberates throughout time. When he said, let there be light, light has never changed. It's reverberated throughout time. When God gives you a promise, it will reverberate throughout time, even to the point of people acknowledging it, writing about it, and people reading about it, and people preaching from it. That's how much it reverberates throughout time, because when he speaks, it knows no time, and so it's there for eternity. 
So we know Abraham from, for eternity. We know David for eternity. People will know Pastor Jason for eternity, and maybe not even just because of actions, but literally, and they will know him because of eternity, because when in heaven, there is no time. And so when we get to heaven, they will know us for eternity. So that's insane. But they will know us not even just by actions, but literally by words. And when we speak the word of God out of us, we literally speak things into existence too. And it's insane to, again, we'll just go down that rabbit hole even more. There's, there's so much we could talk about just on that because that, that, that resonates a lot with my heart, as we say. I, I, I want to leave it on this. And again, I appreciate you being here. This has been a great conversation, giving me a lot just to, be, uh, to enjoy, but also to think about. And for everybody watching, um, I, I hope that these kind of conversations and all the stuff we do, there's every, something every day on our social media and YouTube. I hope that those things, we can call those events, that those are helpful and beneficial and encouraging to you. But I want to I wanna leave with the challenge of don't just let it be that. When this is finished, when the video is done, continue the conversation with just you and God. It doesn't have to be just something you're observing, something that you're watching other people be a part of, or you're part of a group and participating in. Make it real, make it personal where it's just you and God because that's ultimately where the deepest part of the relationship is. So we appreciate you guys. We love you so much. Have a great night.